Hello everyone. We are excited to have Professor Mayur Nayak to give talk in our Zoom seminar. Professor Mayur is a professor and graduate chair in Department of Computer and Information Science at University of Pennsylvania. He is broadly interested in topics related to programming languages and artificial intelligence. His current research is motivated by a need to make AI applications safe, interpretable, data efficient, and easier to develop. Uh, to this end, his research group is developing principled yet practical approaches to neurosymbolic programming and applying them in high stakes domain like healthcare and robotics. He obtained his PhD in computer science from Stanford in 2008 and was a research scientist at Intel Labs at Berkeley and a faculty at Georgia Tech. Uh, Professor Mayunayak, uh, thanks again for accepting our invitation. Uh, you may start presenting whenever you are ready. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Chinmay. It's great to uh, see all of you virtually, and my apologies for not being able to turn on my camera. Um, I spent many wonderful years at uh, Berkeley uh, um, as a research scientist at uh, Intel Labs, so it's wonderful to, to be back to talk to this audience. Um, so today I'll be talking about um, a, a language that we are developing for uh, neurosymbolic uh, programming. And this is joint work with uh, PhD students, Ziyang and Gianni, uh, and uh, a research associate, uh, Nilay, uh, who recently got his bachelor's from UC Berkeley, uh, the EECS department. Okay, so uh, we are all familiar with the two uh, predominant paradigms of programming today. Um, one is classical algorithms and the other is deep learning. Um, some have called this software uh, 1.0 and 2.0 respectively. So classical algorithms, as we know, are uh, suited to solve uh, exactly defined uh, tasks, such as uh, sorting a list of numbers or finding a shortest path in a directed graph and so on. Deep learning, on the other hand, is suited for tasks that cannot be uh, done adequately using classical algorithms. And there are many reasons why that might be. It may be that the tasks themselves are ambiguous, or it may be that classical algorithms are intractable, and so on. And I've just listed two of the most common examples, one being uh, from vision, so detecting objects in an image, and the other being from natural language processing, uh, which is semantic parsing, okay? However, uh, modern AI applications um, uh, seem to need the complementary uh, capabilities of both of these paradigms. And I'm going to show you three such applications, but there are many uh, others uh, out there. So the first is from 2017. Um, this is a diagnostic data set that was developed at Stanford called CLEVER. Stands for Compositional uh, Language and Elementary Visual Reasoning, where you are given an image and a natural language question. Um, and the goal is to uh, answer the question with respect to the image. So in this case, whether they're an equal number of large things and metal cubes. Going forward, we increasingly see video data uh, out there, um, especially in this year. And here's another synthetic benchmark called MUGEN, uh, which stands for a multimodal uh, understanding of uh, video, audio, and text. In this case, uh, you might be given, say, a, a short video clip and uh, a piece of text. And um, you're asked to determine whether the text um, is consistent with what is happening in the video, right? And lastly, um, uh, I have picked a third application here, which is uh, multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, this comes from uh, Google Research, um, which uh, developed this um, RL uh, environment for one of the most popular games in the world, which is uh, soccer, right? Let's do a quick thought exercise and uh, think for ourselves, uh, what uh, would we do to program these applications uh, if we were to use um, classical algorithms and deep learning? Okay, so um, 
what you might have uh, uh, come up with uh, will, I believe, at least have some overlap with what I'm presenting here. So for the first application, Clever, um, you might uh, delegate tasks such as counting and comparison and logical operations to classical algorithms. But on the other hand, uh, you might delegate uh, the low level perception tasks such as object detection or detecting spatial relationships or identifying attributes of objects to deep learning. And similarly, there are uh, uh, counterparts uh, for um, the football uh, benchmark that, I sh that I've shown here. Okay. More generally, um, here is a list um, by no means exhaustive uh, of things that um, I believe classical algorithms are good at and deep learning is good at. So let's go over each of these lists, starting with classical algorithms. So it is obvious that classical algorithms are good at complex reasoning. Um, they are also interpretable. They can be executed uh, and they can give explanations uh, for the solutions they produce. They're also data efficient, um, not data hungry. They can do compositional reasoning for various definitions of compositionality. They can even incorporate domain knowledge from experts. And finally, they can be uh, verified. On the other hand, deep learning is great at rapid reasoning. Um, um, it is also good at handling noise, ambiguity, and naturalness. It can also uh, work with open domain. Um, and what that means is you don't need to elaborate uh, in great detail uh, the vocabulary and so on that uh, you'd like to operate on. They can even use sub-symbolic knowledge. For example, when I use the word Richard, uh, one can associate um, you know, a likely uh, gender uh, with the name. And finally, um, uh, they can learn uh, in context, uh, by which I mean uh, um, paradigms like few short learning uh, that you are seeing increasingly in the context of large language models. Okay, so now that hopefully I've convinced you that it is worth combining these two paradigms because they have complementary benefits, let us look at some of the problems uh, with combining them. So the very first a problem that one runs into is, what is the symbolic representation one should use between the, the deep learning components and the classical algorithms? And how do we extract the symbolic representation from the neural components? Once we have these symbolic representations, how do we do high level reasoning uh, using them, right? What are the appropriate language constructs and what implications uh, do they have? And finally, we'd like to retain uh, the benefits of deep learning, uh, which are um, um, efficient um, stochastic gradient descent algorithms, uh, which typically struggle with uh, discrete symbols. And so how can we uh, extend these algorithms um, to make uh, the resulting combined neurosymbolic program end-to-end uh, -end differentiable. Right. And moreover, uh, while uh, continuing in the realm of being data efficient and producing uh, a program that is generalizable. So one solution to this, to these problems is what is called neurosymbolic learning. So this is an emerging paradigm whose goal is to combine the benefits of both classical algorithms and deep learning by integrating them into a single system, okay? And let me now show you visually what I mean um, by each of these three paradigms. So I'm going to use R to denote um, discrete uh, inputs. So a classical algorithm might take an input R and produce an output Y. And you can assume that there's supervision on R and Y. For example, we might be able to synthesize this algorithm given examples of R and Y. 
Deep learning uh, can not only take uh, discrete inputs R, but they can also take unstructured uh, uh, inputs, which I'm going to denote uh, by X. And furthermore, we have a parameter theta, which are the weights of the neural model. And one of the benefits of this approach is given a lot of X's and Y's, either in a supervised setting or an RL setting and so on, we can learn uh, the weights of the parameter theta uh, using um, uh, uh, different differentiation. Um, and, and there are a lot of algorithms for uh, computing these uh, derivatives efficiently. Neurosymbolic learning uh, combines both of these paradigms um, and it has these two hallmarks, which I'm going to describe using this figure. So the first is differentiable algorithms and the second is algorithmic supervision. So what we have here is we can accept the same kinds of inputs that deep learning can accept. So this can include raw data such as uh, images, video, audio, or even tabular structured data. And we first apply um, a, a neural model to it and obtain a symbolic representation R, which then is fed to a classical algorithm, which in turn produces the final result Y. Now, what I mean by algorithmic supervision is that we are only given uh, supervision on the X, Y pairs, and crucially not on the intermediate result R. Okay. And secondly, um, what I mean by differentiable algorithms is that um, it is possible um, to differentiate this classical algorithm that you see here um, uh, with respect to its input R. And so by composing the derivatives here, uh, dy by dr, and then dr by d theta, uh, we can learn uh, the parameter theta of the neural component um, without having supervision on r. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions before I proceed. Okay, uh, please feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions. So let me now show you the landscape of um, methods that exist out there uh, in neurosymbolic learning. And I've categorized them along these two axes. So on the X axis, uh, we have two categories, um, what I call um, the more principled but impractical approaches and then uh, the practical approaches, but then those uh, which um, are not easy to use uh, and don't generalize beyond um, um, uh, the application of interest. On the y-axis is, um, I again have two axes, I'm uh, sorry, two categories. Um, they are the specialized solutions um, and the, the more general purpose frameworks. And so right off, we can say that um, something that is specialized and inefficient is uninteresting. So we don't have that. Uh, we are not going to look at that quadrant. The vast majority of neurosymbolic learning methods fall on the bottom right, which is they are point solutions uh, to specific applications. And it's not clear how to uh, use reuse those methods to other applications, um, at least not without a lot of manual effort. Yet they are very practical for those applications. On the top uh, far left is uh, very principled approaches such as deep prob log uh, that are based on differentiable uh, uh, probabilistic logic programming. Um, and the reason they are uh, impractical is um, uh, because they rely, as I will show later in the talk, on an expensive procedure uh, such as weighted model counting. 
Now, a good compromise between these is um, solutions like SatNet, uh, which are based on numeric approximations to SAT solving. So they rely on um, the, the advances in scaling SAT solvers, yet they are not as practical nor as general as we'd like, um, because it takes a lot of work to port um, um, an application uh, to the SatNet framework. Our approach, Scallop, um, tries to push the frontiers in both these dimensions. Okay? We want to be more practical uh, and we also want to be more general, right? But notice some crucial things here. Scallop is not as general as, for example, DeepProblog, okay? And the reason for that, as I'll show later, is DeepProblog is based on a Turing complete language, which is uh, Prolog whereas Scallop is based on uh, a domain-specific language called Datalog. Also note that I don't believe Scallop is the ultimate solution, which is uh, the most practical and most general. Um, as I said, Scallop has a domain-specific language for symbolic reasoning. Uh, and so we believe that there is a lot of room to keep uh, going here to the corner of the top right. Okay, so how does Scallop achieve um, a balance between generality and practicality? So if you recall the three challenges that I showed, the first was about uh, uh, the relational, the, the symbolic representation um, that is used um, at the interface of the neural and the classical um, components. And our solution is to use um, the relational data model which I'll go into more detail later in the talk. Our solution to the second challenge I mentioned is to use a declarative logic programming language for uh, symbolic reasoning, okay? And I'll again elaborate on this later. And finally, um, our solution to the third challenge is um, to support automatic and efficient uh, differentiable reasoning um, to compute these uh, partial derivatives dy by dr using a framework uh, called uh, provenance semi-rings. Okay. So these are the three key ideas behind Scallop. And I'll go into each of these uh, in the rest of my talk. So let's start with the relational representation. So as you know uh, from, say, a course on relational databases, uh, relations are uh, very versatile. Um, they can represent arbitrary graphs, can even be used as a glue language uh, for multimodal data, such as images and, and uh, natural language uh, text. They can even succinctly represent discrete probability distributions. So as I will show in, my, uh, in the rest of my talk, um, answering a question like this uh, about this image will involve actually reasoning about many worlds simultaneously and how to compactly represent information in all these worlds is something that relations are uh, very well suited for. And finally, there are lots of practical benefits um, the relational data model was proposed, I believe, in, in the 19, late 1970s. It has withstood the test of time, and along with it uh, have come various performance optimizations, such as join algorithms and efficient data structures uh, for processing uh, large-scale data, which we can now reuse for efficient inference and learning in Scallop. And furthermore, much of the world's uh, structured data is locked in relational databases. And so um, using the relational uh, data model allows Scallop applications to seamlessly incorporate this data as knowledge. Okay. So I said some time ago that uh, relations are versatile. So how do we represent um, say image data and natural language uh, data? 
So on the left, I've shown you a graph, um, which is a standard representation for images. It's called a scene graph, where the nodes can be either the objects, O1 through O5, or they can be their attributes, um, such as their shape or the color uh, or the material and so on. And then we have edges uh, connecting um, these objects to their attributes. Likewise, natural language text can be represented using abstract syntax trees. Okay, and I've shown here one where the nodes of the abstract syntax tree are labeled A through H. And each node has a type. Um, for example, it can be the entire scene that we are talking about. So all the objects O1 through O5, or I might want to only filter objects that have the attribute large, okay? Which would in this case, presumably be O4 and O5. And finally, I might want to equate the counts of two sets of objects that I'm seeing here, which is what this query is asking for whether they are an equal number of large things and metal cubes, okay? So in summary, we can represent a lot of different kinds of data uh, using relations. We even have video data at this point where a video can simply be viewed as a sequence of frames where each frame has a scene graph. Okay, so now let's look a bit deeper into how um, say the scene graph is represented in Scallop. So because we are using the relational data model, um, every piece of information becomes a relational tuple. So for example, this tuple here says that uh, we have a binary relation called size. Um, what does it do? It denotes which objects uh, have what size. So for example, we might say the object O4 here is, has, has a large size, okay? And the way we, we write this in scallop is simply uh, using this rel keyword. We can even have types for relations. So in this case, I've created a type called expressions, EXPR, whose domain is these AST nodes from A to H. And I can say, for example, that the scene relation contains just one tuple. It's a unary relation and um, it contains the tuple A. You can also add another tuple, which is D here, uh, but I've not shown it here. Okay. Let's go a bit further. Here's another relation, which is capturing another kind of AST node, which is a binary relation called filter size. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a ternary relation. It has three columns. The first column is the expression ID, which is something like B. The second column talks about the child of this expression, which is A. And the third column talks about an attribute of the expression I'm looking at, which is B. And one attribute it has is large, right? So this tuple here says that there is an AST node with ID B whose child is A and it has an attribute large, right? And this is a way to filter all the objects that you see in this scene that have the large attribute, okay? We can continue this way. Um, for example, if I'm looking at uh, AST nodes of type count, I can define a relation um, in this case, which says that expression ID C is of type count and it seeks to count the objects uh, described by uh, the expression ID B, right? So this entire chain that you see here evaluates to the number of large objects in the scene, okay? Which is what this question is trying to ask in its first part in order to tell whether there's an equal number of large things and metal cubes, I first need to count the number of large things. And that is what this entire expression is doing. And this is how it's written in Scallop. So before I proceed to the next part, let me again pause and see if there are any questions. And please unmute if you have. Uh, any questions at any time. 
Okay, I'm next going to talk about uh, our next building block. Now that you have seen the symbolic representation that we use, how can we write uh, high level uh, reasoning constructs using uh, this symbolic representation? So our solution is to use a language uh, based on data log. Those of you who are not familiar with data log, you must have heard about SQL, uh, which is the most popular programming language for relational uh, databases. All that data log does is extends SQL with recursion. It is still not Turing complete, unlike something like deep prob log. And in that sense, scallop is not the most expressive that it could possibly be. Yet in return for this limited expressiveness, uh, we end up having efficient algorithms for query resolution. How do these algorithms help? Because now we can divide um, an application into its neural and logic components, there is less um, work to be done uh, for learning uh, the parameters of the neural component uh, because a lot of the heavy lifting will now be done by the logic component. And if we have efficient algorithms for evaluating uh, the logic component on different inputs, then that speeds up both inference and learning of the parameters of the neural components. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you that in return for giving up some expressiveness, we get a lot of benefit um, in terms of speeding up inference and learning. Okay. And this is what crucially distinguishes Scallop from works like Deep Prop Log. That said, the expressiveness is still um, quite uh, significant. For example, many of the common reasoning patterns that neural approaches struggle with can be expressed in scallop. And I've just listed the three most common ones here. Recursion uh, is often needed for what is called multi-hop reasoning. Um, um, we have support for aggregation. So for things like counting and so on, which again, neural networks struggle with. And lastly, um, uh, negation. So we support uh, uh, that as well, which is yet another pattern that neural approaches typically struggle with. And lastly, um, notice that data log, just like SQL, is a declarative language. Uh, in fact, it is rule-based, and this comes with lots of benefits. For example, it is very easy to write uh, programs in data log especially as you are debugging and incrementally building a scallop application. Rules can be verified. Um, they can even be synthesized using ideas from inductive logic programming or program synthesis, right? So you don't even necessarily need to write down all the rules. You could even learn the rules themselves from data. And lastly, rules can be probabilistic, which allows to incorporate uncertain knowledge. Okay, so now that I've told you the high level benefits of this language, let me walk you through some of the most uh, common constructs in this language. So the first is, let's look at conjunction. So I told you how uh, we express relations, for example, um, uh, the fact here that the object O1 in the scene is a metallic object, right? So we use the relation material um, to denote what objects have what kind of material. And let us say I have another relation called shape, which is also extracted from um, uh, this image, which captures what is the shape of each object, such as O1 is a cube. Once I have these relational representations, I can write a rule like this, which says, get me all the objects in the scene whose shape is a cube and whose material is metal, right? So those of you familiar with horn clauses will understand uh, this, what this rule is saying. You typically read it from right to left, 
Okay. Um, so we have on the left, what is called the head of the rule. And on the right, we have the body. And we use comma to denote conjunction. So the way to read this rule is, um, if O is a shape with attribute cube, and O is also uh, has material metal, then uh, O belongs to the relation filter object. Okay, so it's a if then rule, also called a horn clause. Now let's look at disjunction. What if the question was slightly changed to say, not that I want all metal cubes, but what if I wanted things that are either metallic or that are cubes? In this case, I simply write two different rules with the same head. So I filter an object O, uh, either if its shape is a cube or its material is a metal, right? And when you evaluate this program on the relational representation corresponding to this example, then I've shown a derivation which gives you the proof uh, why object O1 uh, was filtered. Okay, because in this case, O1 happens to be both a metal and a cube. Uh, but if either one of these were true, that would be enough for O1 to be filtered. The last construct I'm going to illustrate um, in my talk is uh, aggregation, okay? So in this case, I changed the question again to count all the cyan cylinders in the image. So I want all the objects in the image that are of shape cylinder and color cyan, right? So in this case, first I'm going to extract all objects that match these two attributes. So they're cyan cylinders. And then I have an aggregation here since I'm trying to count them. So this syntax here says, count all objects O that satisfy this condition here of cyan cylinder. Name the count N and produce this result, a unary relation with that count. And in this case, there are two objects which are both cylindrical and of cyan color. If you squint at this image, you'll see that O2 satisfies that condition. So O2 both has color cyan and shaped cylinder. And so O2 qualifies. And so does O3 over here. It also satisfies both of these criteria. And finally, the count of such objects is two because by applying the second rule here, we have a derivation which explains why uh, we have two cyan cylinders. We have many other constructs in this language that I'm not going to go into details. Um, and we are still growing the language. Um, I mentioned that we have recursion. And this expression here shows you, for example, how we can evaluate all the objects in the scene according to certain criteria that I described earlier. We also support negation, foreign functions that cannot be written in logic, but might need to be written in a black box uh, language like say Python or Java. We also support group by and quantifiers. Let me once again pause and see if there are any questions before I proceed to the final challenge. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, the last part, which is how we support automatic and efficient differentiable reasoning uh, in Scala. So first of all, even though I so far showed you only um, uh, discrete reasoning, in reality, all of these relations come uh, from neural components. And so they have associated probabilities with them. For example, we don't know for certain that the object O4 uh, is large, but we know with probability say 0 0.92 that it is large, but we also believe with probability 0 0.08 that it is small, right? 
In the same way uh, for the natural language uh, data, we have these 11 basic functions such as scene, filter size, count, and so on. And each of them have certain arguments like the size and the shape and the material and so on. And all of those are also probabilistic. So for example, a semantic parser might return that um, uh, this AST node P um, is filtering um, objects described by AST node A and has attribute large, but only with a certain probability. And then it will have other possibilities uh, with certain probabilities as well. I'd like to also note a nice advantage of scallop here that we noticed in our evaluation. Even if a semantic parser, which is neural, gets a part of this uh, parse tree incorrect, it can still recover from the mistake because it is not constructing um, the entire uh, expression as a program, uh, which many semantic parsing approaches typically do. Okay, we are instead expressing this entire uh, uh, piece of text as a set of relations, as a set of tuples with probabilities. And so even if we might get a part of this uh, interpretation incorrect, we will typically be able to recover from that mistake, unlike many existing semantic parsing approaches. Okay. What we have at this point is, instead of um, a discrete database, we have a probabilistic database. So with each tuple um, that is coming from the neural components, we have an associated probability. And now uh, we can do probabilistic reasoning uh, over these rules that we have written. For example, we can assign Boolean variables such as F1, F2, and F3 to each of the facts that we are deriving. And we can ask, for example, what is the probability that O1 is an object that is metallic and a cube? Well, the neural network tells us that the object O1 is metallic with probability 0 0.91. And it tells us that O1 is a cube with probability 0 0.84. And since this is the rule for conjunction, we can derive that the probability of F3 is um, using this formula um, 0 0.91 times 0 0.84, which is 0 0.76. Let me do another quick example of disjunction. So here I'm showing you how to compute the probability that the object O1 is either metallic or shaped as a cube, right? And in this case, uh, if you do the calculation, it comes to 0 0.99. Now, it turns out that a general way to do these calculations is using a procedure called weighted model counting. Let me intuitively explain this procedure. So one can imagine that we no longer have a single world, okay? But every object, for example, in this image has a certain shape with a certain probability or a certain material with a certain probability. And so one can imagine enumerating or discretizing all of these worlds and assigning a probability to each of these worlds, which is simply the product of the probabilities uh, of, of the facts in that world or their complements. So weighted model counting is this very expensive procedure for exact probabilistic reasoning. And there's been a lot of advances in making it efficient or in approximating it. But still, when we look at more sophisticated constructs or larger programs and larger databases, we quickly see um, a combinatorial explosion of possibilities as I will illustrate using this final query, which is counting the number of cyan cylinders. So in this case, we have every possibility from a count of zero, in which case none of these five objects is a cyan cylinder, uh, to um, the case where all of these objects are cyan cylinders, okay, for a count of uh, five. Let's just look at one of the outputs. 
which is the fact that there are zero cyan cylinders in this image. And let's give the Boolean variable a name F16. Then the probability that there are zero cyan cylinders is simply that none of these facts uh, is, none of these Boolean variables is true. What are these Boolean variables? Each of them corresponds to deriving that the corresponding object is a cyan cylinder. We can do that for the case of one science cylinder. And already you see an explosion in the formula here, which says that either O1 is a science cylinder and none of the rest are, or O2 is a science cylinder and none of the rest are, and so on and so forth. And in each of these cases, we get the count of one. And as we continue this calculation, we have all six possibilities from zero science cylinders to five. And we can, make a call to a weighted model counting solver for each of these six cases, and it involves an expensive probability calculation. But at this point, one has to ask, do we really want exact probabilities, right? And what about um, the, the gradients that we wanted to also obtain? How can we get those efficiently? So as I said, WMC is exact, but quickly becomes intractable. But the key insight here is we don't need exact probabilities or gradients. Machine learning algorithms such as batched stochastic gradient descent are already approximate. But a big problem with all of these approximate learning approaches um, is that they have their own limitations. Um, for example, they do not leverage logic rules. They have limited syntax. Um, they lack generalizability and so on. And so the key problem we set out to solve in this final challenge is how to solve these problems of probabilistic and differentiable reasoning um, in an approximate yet systematic fashion. And our idea is um, a decade old solution for data log and deductive databases called provenance semi-rings. I'm not going to go into the math here, but let me just give you a historical perspective. So about a decade ago, uh, there were various extensions to relational databases where researchers in that community realized that they could tag relational tuples with anything from probabilities to more complex structures, such as proofs of how those tuples were derived from inputs, right? And then there was a landmark paper around, I believe uh, in, in the late 2000s, um, in, in around 2005, which showed that all of these applications um, of tagging relational tuples um, could be viewed as instances of an algebraic structure called a semi-ring. Right? And I've shown the structure here in the table at the bottom. All you have to define is a tag space T, okay, an identity element zero and one, and the operations uh, plus and multiply. There are a few other operations such as negation, which I've omitted here. But if you can define this algebraic structure called a semi-ring with certain properties, um, uh, that a semi-ring has, then you can essentially get um, um, these tags computed efficiently uh, for a language like data lock. And that is what we have implemented in Scala. And until now, no one had applied provenance semi-rings to the problem of differentiable reasoning. And by adopting data log as a symbolic reasoning language, we were the first to bring the benefits of provenance semi-rings to this new application domain of differentiable reasoning uh, for neurosymbolic applications. I have shown you just three semi-rings here. The ones to the left are very cheap to compute because they associate with each tuple just a probability. We call these the min-max probability semi-ring and the add-mult probability semi-ring, okay? And what these semi-rings do is that they are approximating the probabilistic approximation, um, the, the, the probabilistic computation that I showed earlier. 
um, by following the structure of the logic rules. On the far right is a semiring that we use most commonly. It is top K proofs. In fact, the weighted model counting uh, computation that I showed you can be viewed as top infinity proofs, where we essentially keep all the derivations as we do forward chaining. Top K on the other hand gives you a tunable parameter K, which lets you keep only um, the, the highest probability uh, K proofs. And let me explain this with an example here. Coming back to the example of counting the, the number of cyan cylinders, what we have here is a total of uh, 10 different worlds given these five objects, O1 through O5. In world one, only O2 and O3 are cyan cylinders. And in that world, we have a probability of 0 0.71 according to the neural network that is either being trained or has already been trained. In world two, objects O2 and O5 are cyan cylinders and so on and so forth. If we did exact probabilistic reasoning, then that would correspond to the formula at the bottom right, where the K would be at least 10, because 10 is the number of worlds we have. But we could have even set K as low as one. And if that was the case, then the weighted model uh, counting solver would be given this much smaller formula that you see here. And in this case, we would only pick um, the most likely world, which has the highest probability here, right? So I hope with this figure, you see um, this illustration of how you can tune um, how much um, of the logic reasoning to incorporate uh, for computing, not just the probabilities of the final result, but also the gradients, which I've not shown over here, okay? So computing the gradients, um, uh, with respect to um, the outputs of the neural network is a straightforward extension of weighted model counting that I've not shown in this slide. Okay, so we have implemented all of this in um, Scallop, which is open source. Uh, we have uh, you know, a lot of documentation and infrastructure, and we have written a lot of different applications. And in the interest of time, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. So I'm showing just a, a few of the applications that are public. Um, um, and we have applications from vision, uh, from natural language processing and uh, you know, video processing and multimodal data and knowledge graph querying and so on. And um, um, again, I'm going to skip some of this empirical evaluation. Um, but have, we, we have done various experiments to show data efficiency and accuracy and, and generalizability and so on. Um, I'm very briefly going to uh, show you a, a, a brief uh, demo here that you can try on your own. So we have a web assembly plugin here at this URL. And in this case, I have written a simple scallop program where I'm trying to answer this question. Are there more big green things than large purple shiny cubes? And in this WebAssembly plugin, I cannot show you the neural model because that is written in Python, right? But at least I can show you an, a sample instance where you can imagine that a neural model has produced this particular scene graph with various probabilities. And you can pick different semi-rings here, such as top K proofs. And uh, you can run this and it will show you that the answer, the final result of this query is true with probability uh, 0 0.81. You can even reduce K. Um, and in that case, uh, you might see some small changes in the result. You can also increase it. Um, and this um, you know, will give you, you know, accordingly a higher precision, but will also take longer, okay? So we are almost out of time. I just want to, you know, wrap the talk up here. 
So we saw that modern AI applications pose a large number of challenges such as interpretability, data efficiency, generalizability, and so on. And neurosymbolic learning is this emerging paradigm to address these challenges. But it currently has its own problems such as scalability. Um, for example, it is nowhere close to crunching the amounts of data that we see uh, deep learning approaches handle. There's also problems with efficiency. So training these programs uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion. And finally, accessibility. And what I mean by that is, even though there's a large number of papers being written, there is no unified framework that can uh, be readily used the way you can use, say, PyTorch or Python or Java, right? And so Scallop aims to address these problems by combining ideas from these three uh, uh, different uh, uh, techniques that I presented today. With that, I thank everyone for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Meyer, for your talk and uh, giving such a clear explanation of these tools and their capabilities. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I think if there are no more questions, then we can, oh, there's I think one question in the chat. Uh, I can read that in relational database design, ER diagrams have proven quite useful to help build models of real world systems. Do you think for neurosymbolic system design, there is an analog analogous valuable diagrammatic technique, especially in intuitively capturing probabilistic as well as stru strictly deductive logical aspects of the real world systems being modeled? Yes, sure. Uh, so, you know, I think that's a great question. As I said, the benefits of uh, the relational data model carry over and indeed entity relationship diagrams or ER diagrams are a conceptual uh, first step to designing your schema and then normalizing it all the way down to uh, sensible relations. And I skipped all of that here and went directly to the implementation level showing you the relations. But you could, you know, if, if you were to build a real application, then sure, you would follow the systematic methodology from relational databases, starting with ER diagrams that are high level and conceptual and systematically normalizing them to the relations that I ended up showing you. Okay, I'll be happy to take any questions offline. Please feel free to email me, um, try Scallop out. Uh, we are always looking for collaborators, you know, in, in especially in robotics and related applications. So, um, and, and we are hoping to actually collaborate with a bunch of Berkeley faculty, including Claire and many others uh, um, as part of, you know, hopefully a DARPA program uh, that will begin in, in a few more uh, months. Great. Uh, okay, so yeah, thanks Professor Mayu for giving this terrific talk. Uh, I'll just stop the recording now. <laughs>